This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Huawei, much in the news these last years because of suspicions that it is not secure, that it is a bad actor. I welcome Jonathan Pelson, the author of a new book, Wireless Wars, China's Dangerous Domination of 5G and How We're Fighting Back. Jonathan, a very good evening to you. Thank you very much. And congratulations. I go to a scene in your book, Colin Golder, arriving in China at the behest of the United Nations Funds and Trust. He stays at the Minzu Hotel, the date 1980. He takes a walk around town in Beijing, breathing in the coal dust that fills the air. And he sees satisfied young people because they have a watch, a bicycle, a sewing machine, and a radio, three, sound, three rounds and a sound. However, he's there to present about telecommunications to Chinese engineers. He walks into a room filled with engineers and identical Mao suits, men and women. What is he telling him, John? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. So nice to be here. And Colin Golder is up in front of that room and he's trying to tell them how to build a telecom network. You have a country here that has a GDP in 1980 of about $195 per person, which was about half of Sudan at the time, and 1% uh, or so of the GDP of the United States. They had one phone line per 500 people, and they understood in China that one of the first ways to build uh, an economy, and Deng Xiaoping was figured out this needed to be done, is to create communications channels. Companies, businesses can talk to each other, people can talk. And they needed to have someone come in and explain really what a phone network was. They had hand cranked phones like we had half a century earlier in rural parts of the United States. That was still not uncommon in China of 1980. 1980, we go to AT&T headquarters, which I imagine in a vast green canvas campus somewhere between here and Mars. But in any event, in the room is a collection of the senior executives, the innovative executives of a company that dominates telecommunications, especially because of its Bell Labs, also in New Jersey. A man named Jim Brewington is in the room watching a presentation by McKinsey and Company about the practicality of investing in and building a wireless division. This dates from a, something that had happened seven years before when an engineer at Motorola had called an engineer at AT&T on what he called a wireless phone, a great big brick box. That was seven years before. Motorola, I learned from you, pursued that. AT&T hesitated. What did the McKinsey study say of the possibility of investing in wireless, John? Well, you know, my, my kids tell me I have to explain who Bell Labs even is. Uh, you know, I look at this company, nine Nobel laureates in physics in one company. But this is a company that not only invented the telephone, but invented sound movies, invented stereo, invented transistors, lasers, solar panels, communication satellites. This was the world's most brilliant company. They had invented cellular communications. And now they had McKinsey in there, who's the, the great consulting firm of the world, who was asked to tell them, should we invest in this new mobile phone thing, the cellular phone thing? And McKinsey told them, there is no future in this. We looked at the market. We interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people. And what we found is that the market for cellular phones is going to tap out at around 900,000 people total. And... Uh, we found what people said is they really like pay phones and beepers, pagers, if they want to be in touch when they're on the road. And, you know, this is a, the biggest, smartest company in the world talking to the biggest, smartest industrial company in the world. And they were trying to make a prediction. You know, the, the guys there were not stupid, but they were making a prediction on no data points. And they didn't understand that this 80 pound suitcase in the trunk of your Cadillac Fleetwood would be in the palm of your hand and that $5 a minute charge would be unlimited calling in, in just a few years. So at the time they told 
AT&T, there's nothing in this. Now, now, when they said there'd be just under a million people by the year 2000, uh, the actual number turned out to be just under a billion people that had cell phones. And penetration wasn't 0.5% of the market. Penetration was about 100% in, in a lot of the world. Jim Brewington was in the room. He watched people leave. He knew this was not connecting to what he'd heard about wireless. It is now 11 years later. Brewington is in charge of AT&T Wireless. There's competition. I've heard of it, but I've not actually seen one yet. I think my brother had one because he traveled a lot, but I don't know whether he used it in 91. Brew calls in a 23-year-old engineer from Ohio State, David Hurd. He tells David, go to China. You go to China for us. And you present to China. Uh, you deal with China and see what they've got for us. What did David Hurd find when he went to China? Well, I, I find it incredible that this company sent a 23-year-old off to China to negotiate on behalf of the world's biggest communications company, how to set up the first joint ventures for a factory in China. Uh, but Brewington made the right choice. David Hurd, uh, when I was talking to him about the book, interviewing him, I said, so you were going to school nights while you worked at at and He said, no, no, John, I was going to school full time. I was working at at and nights. I said, okay. Well, he had a reputation for energy. The Chinese were going to wear him down. He said, they met with us 7 a.m. We would start seven or eight every morning. We'd go all day until late at night, seven days a week. And they figured these Americans, we're going to wear him down. He's just going to want to sign a deal to get home. And they wanted, in, they wanted IP sharing. They wanted the state-of-the-art digital cellular equipment. But Heard was given direction by Brewington, don't let them have the good stuff in the factory. They can take the old first-generation cellular and refurbish it. That's all we want the Chinese factory to do. That, that was the 1G, John? That was 1G. We're going to pull out old 1G gear, and they can refix it up. And it's not even digital. It's analog equipment. And China was not happy about this. They did not like getting treated like a second class country. But basically what, what Brewington was doing is taking discarded equipment from American cellular carriers. Instead of throwing it away, he was shipping it to China, letting the factory fix it up, adjust it to the local market, and upgrading the American companies to 2G digital, where you had texting and, and some more capabilities. And, and week after week, they would wear away at, at David Hurd and, and the lawyer who was with him and uh, just figured they'd break them, but, but they held tough. And uh, I, I liked the, the story how the, the lawyer there sat there quietly in the meetings and right towards the end, he pulled David aside and said, here's the numbers they need. Here's their metrics for, for beating us. And he, David said, how do you know all this? He said, I speak fluent Mandarin. I just didn't want them to know it. I can understand what they were saying to each other when the interpreter was away. Yes, he married a Chinese woman. That's right. And the Chinese hadn't yet learned to do a trace on the people they're dealing with. I, I think they've improved their style since then. Now, it's 1992, the factory opens. So AT&T, which is now Lucent, is it Lucent yet? That's right. It, uh, not Lucent. quite, there was still AT&T equipment at the time. All right, but they're now dealing with a factory in China. And at the same time, a man named Ren, about this time, is getting together, the, so goes the story. Uh, investment from his friends, $5,000. Who is Ren? What do we need to know about him at this moment? Ren Zhengfei was the founder of Huawei. He was not a senior intel officer in the Chinese army, the People's Liberation Army, which I've heard some people say. He was not a big deal there because, and you know that because he left the army during a downsizing, and he knocked around with some oil companies for a while and, and really didn't have uh, the career path you would expect a senior guy who was being assigned to set up Huawei. He set it up on his own. It was a private company, and he was just a, was and is a very smart, hardworking, driven manager. He, he raised a little bit of money, started importing fire alarms from Hong Kong, and then then started importing a low-end switch, the kind that you would put in your office to connect the desktop phones to each other, not a big telecom switch. But he was just someone who had a lot more drive than a lot of his colleagues who said, well, just 
take whatever the American companies or European companies give us. And he wanted to create his own products. Now, it doesn't mean he wanted to invent them from scratch, but he got funding. And then the government realized that he had a better product than the government run company. And they said, we need you to build out the military's communications network in China. They, they were dealing initially with PBX, right? Which is uh, connecting in offices, a lot of phones together. Very, nothing to do with uh, my iPhone. No connection, no imagination whatsoever about wireless phones. Very low end wired connections. In fact, it was a Mitel switch that he was importing on behalf of Mitel. And suddenly Mitel noticed their numbers going down, but they saw their switches were still being sold. So what he was doing is he was ripping off the Mitel PBX of in the offices. He was. Of course he was. And, you know, and that was the beginning. And I spoke to one of the guys who was there and he said, we just shrugged and said, you know what, let's just sell him the chipset. We'll make some money off of our knockoff switches being sold. And that's what they did. All right. Here are the elements in Jonathan Pelson's book. We've see, Can you see the future? We've got Huawei founded by a hard, a knock around guy. We've got Lucent semi-understanding that the wireless market is big. We've got Americans saying, let's do them a favor. We've got Chinese showing up in droves saying, what's this? What can we do with this? And we have a lot of pity going on because China's not a member of the World Trade Organization yet. When we come back with Jonathan Pelson, Wireless Wars, State Security enters the scene. John, there's a scene in your book that doesn't stand up to reality. It lacks verisimilitude if this was a novel. The woman's name is Madam Sun Yi Feng. Who is she? And when does she walk into the room? Yeah, so, so in fact, Colin Golder, who had stood in front of that room several, many years later, is called in. Uh, the Saudis were trying to get China to start buying their oil. And one of the Saudi ministers, really up, up at the top of the royal family, called Lucent, which was now at AT&T's division, equipment division was called, and said, you know what? You guys are doing this huge build out of the Saudi telecom network. You're building out all the equipment. Why don't you get Huawei, this Chinese company, to help you on the project? So help them put a bid together and submit it to us. It was charity. It was charity. It was just trying to you know, grease the skids to get China to buy some more oil. And they said, we'll buy some of your electronics. So, so Colin goes off there. He's going to teach them how to put together a bid. And they had someone show up who was, didn't know what was going on. He said, look, this is not going to work. I need someone who can work with me. So he came back the next day. And there's a young woman, well-dressed. And she introduces herself as Madam Sun, the chairwoman of Huawei. With an interpreter. She, with an interpreter. She, she evidences that she doesn't have English. Doesn't speak English. And she kind of struggles with him. And she... He tells her, we're going to work together. We're going to put together a bid for this small project in Saudi Arabia. And he, Colin told me by the end of the week, she was actually speaking some English, uh, more than he would have thought. And uh, I looked into this. And what I found is that her, her backstory was that she had joined Huawei from a TV and radio manufacturer. Unfortunately for her, she was an alum of a technical school, an engineering school, and the alumni newsletter had printed, published on the internet, this wonderful glowing profile saying, our graduate, Madam Sun, who left to become a superstar at the Ministry of State Security, has now been sent over to Huawei. And boy, has she helped that company. She's bringing government money in when they needed it, when they were in trouble. And we're so proud of her. It's, you know, kind of a girl power, kind of an article they wrote about her saying, you know, this is, this is a, such a source of pride for us. It is now 2002. Patricia Russo is in charge of everything at AT&T and Lucent. Bell Labs is still a star. <clears throat> Evidence is brought to the CEO, the boss, in April of 2002 that three foreign nationals, employees of a company, have been downloading source code. Who were they? They were uh, employees and contractors, Chinese nationals, and they were working on something called the Path Star project, which was something that would um, allow phone calls to be made over cable, over coaxial cable, like your cable TV company, which was a big deal at the time that was not being done. And uh, they stole the source code. FBI found the code in their homes that found hardware from the switch. One of them jumped bail and fled back to China, but the other two were captured and held by the FBI. 
And when Pat Russo, she was the, the CEO of Lucent, she went over to China. They were very clear with her. We were, first of all, they said, we have nothing to do with these people. We don't know who they are, but if you prosecute them, you're cut off. We were not buying anything more from your company. And this is a billion dollar account for Lucent. The connection here is to a few years earlier, D'Amelio, Frank D'Amelio, is uh, welcomed by an engineer who puts two objects on the table in front of him, is how I picture it, John. One is a CNC 08 switch made by Huawei. Another one is a Bell 5E made by, the, uh, made by Lucent, which is the flagship. They're exactly the same, correct? They're exactly the same. This is a few years before they're caught downloading source code. That's right. This, this is a switch. This is a million dollar per switch device. This is what connects. You know, you'll put one of these in, in a city and it connects a million lines. Uh, and it was the bread and butter for Lucent. It was their main telecommunication switch. And it had hundreds of thousands of lines of code, more than that. It took years, decades to refine and build this. And yet Huawei had come up with one in just a couple of years. And Frank looked at it. He said, even the color of the wires was identical. And when they closed the door, he saw that the drill pattern for the ventilation holes matched exactly the Lucent switch. It's 2011, British Telecom is now confronting Huawei and Huawei wants their business. This you make a point of saying is how Huawei got into Europe. Did BT understand these security problems from Lucent? Did, it, did the business know about them? Well, yes and no. They certainly didn't buy it thinking that this was uh, kind of compromised equipment they were putting into the network. Uh, the company, Ben Verwine was the CEO. He took over a company, British Telecom, that was really in sad shape. They were hemorrhaging money. They had huge debt. And they were going to, he bet the farm on saying broadband is the future. And he was right. So he built at this very sophisticated network with his CTO, Matt Bross. He had brought in the new chief technology officer. And when they bid out this project, China, Huawei was so much cheaper. And he was saying, I'm in no position to be a charity and say, I'm going to give the business to Marconi of the UK or I'm gonna give the business to Ericsson or, or Nokia when China's doing a better, cheaper job with what they bid and more innovative at the time, more flexible. They put the equipment in, the government was never consulted. They decided we didn't wanna jeopardize Chinese diplomatic relations. Cause I looked at what was the process? What did the, the parliament do? And they said, we didn't wanna say anything to them until the deal was done because we were afraid they would step on it. Huawei is hiring. When we come back, they're hiring the best sales force in the world from everybody, and they're paying lots of money for it. What can go wrong and why? The book is Jonathan Pelson's Wireless Wars, China's Dangerous Domination of 5G and How We're Fighting Back. It is now the recession, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, 2010. Many companies are moving, making considerations about their future because of the crash on Wall Street, the doubts about the future, the price of money. However, Huawei is hiring. And Jonathan Pelson's book takes us into a room in Richardson, Texas, where salesmen, salespeople, really good with, you know, as Jonathan teaches me, if you've got a book of customers, you're worth a lot of money. You just have to pay you the right money. Huawei is bidding on these sales force from everywhere. And they're sometimes increasing their compensation by 30%. So they're all gathered in a room waiting for something to happen. Some of them, I imagine, have been there for days. It's a rudimentary room. They're on folding chairs. There's some big hitters in the room. And in walks an HR woman who gives them a speech. What does she tell them, John? Well, she's talking to these people and they're all, some of them have been laid off from from Lucent or Nokia or Siemens, whoever. Some of them were hired away, lured away from those companies. And she's explaining how it will be working for Huawei now. And she says, uh, among other things, she says, please stop submitting expenses or incurring expenses. And they're, some of them are getting nervous because their former employers did that just before they went under. They said, what, did, did we get sold a bill of goods here? Is Huawei going under? What's happening? She explains that all the Expenses are being handled on her American Express card for the company. Travel, parties, office supplies. 
And she says, you, you have to hold off until I pay off this month. She just didn't understand, I think, how things were done in the US. But she also said, when you are traveling on business, and these are salespeople, some of them are making three, $400,000 a year. These are big players. She says, I want you to be sure to stay with friends when you're in a foreign city. Find someone whose couch you can sleep on. If you absolutely must get a hotel room, and there's more than one of you on the trip, we want you all sharing that room together. One of the hitters, one of the major senior figures, stands up, walks out of the room, turns in his Huawei-issued computer, and walks out the door. Was that a majority opinion at the time, or was everybody willing to go along with this startup? People were hanging in there at the start, but what they found is there was really no business traction. Huawei for all of its resources they were putting, was not really making any sales in the United States, at least not to any of the big carriers like Sprint or Verizon or AT&T Wireless. Ron Marino, 20, 2011. Remember, this is during the Great Recession and the recovery. America's economy is fragile. But in any event, the market for the smartphone is growing because iPhone is launched in 2007, 2008 is my memory. And it's dominating the market. Nokia is the other builder, and that's, I think, Samsung. And so what we, uh, Samsung is making chips. Everybody's competing here. And Huawei wants into the market. And so they also want to know what's going on at the front lines of it, research and development in smartphones, in wireless technology, in we're all with 4G at this time, right, John? 4G is pretty uniform. That's right. We're going from 3G to 4G around now. Right. And Ron Marino takes a plane to China. He's got a cell phone he's been issued. However, when he gets off the plane in Beijing, no one meets him and the cell phone doesn't work. So fine. He makes his way to Shenzhen's headquarters of Huawei, walks in the door, and he's asked for his cell phone immediately by the security guard, which he gives over because, of course, it doesn't work anyway. Why was he surprised in the building, John? What was he there to do? Well, he's there as a new engineer employee. He works on radios, uh, on antennas is really his expertise, radios and antennas. Uh, he's worked for defense contractors. He's worked for telecom companies. And antennas are getting pretty sophisticated now in the, in the latest generation of wireless. They're not just big, dumb things you bolt to a, to a tower. But as he's walking through the offices to the conference room, he sees a gun safe at every desk. And he's thinking, what in the world? What are they? Are they armed here? What's going on at Huawei headquarters? Who are they afraid of? He gets to the conference room. He spends eight hours just being peppered by rotating teams of Huawei engineers, just asking him about everything he's worked on. How does it work? What does it do? not your typical project for a new hire. They're just trying to pump his brains for whatever he knows. And on his way out of the office, he sees what those safes are. They're not actually gun safes. Everyone is clearing off their desk and stuffing everything into the safe and locking it because they don't want their information to be stolen. And I asked him, who, you, who would have stolen their information? Is, you know, is, are they afraid that Ericsson's going to break into a Shenzhen office building? He said, no, no. Partially, they're worried about ZTE, another Chinese company up the street. But they're also worried about the guy down the hall. Said they steal each other's work. They present it as their own. They get more budget. They get more kudos. And they don't want anyone to see anything they're working on or anything they've touched. That modest man, Ren, he explains this by calling it a wolf culture. Ren had a meeting, I believe it was in 1997, with uh, Zhen Ziming. Yes, he, he, met, he met the boss and he was blessed by the boss, the chair, general secretary at the time. Was it Deng Xiaoping? Who did he meet in 97? Uh, right? I, I think it was, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember who, who, would have, who he would have met that year. It's all right. He met the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, Deng Xiaoping. Okay. Yeah. And that everybody knows that Ren is blessed and they leave him alone to develop this country, uh, the company. But the company is now going from being invited in by Lucent to being suspect as a security risk. I noted one of the questions that 
Marina was asked in your summary, John, was how do we get around this patent? Now, John, uh, I know a couple of lawyers. That like is a fire alarm. Did anybody back home know what was going on here? They, they, no one outside of the people in the midst of it understood what was really happening at this point. And, and Ron told me, he said, look, they were paying me great money to do this. But he said, and he said, I would not share with them anything that was classified because he had worked on a lot of classified projects. But he said, I just wasn't comfortable. He said, also, the technology for cellular at the time, the very sophisticated antennas, if you took the frequency up to a different frequency broadcast level, that's what was being used for anti-missile technology at the time. And he said, I knew it and China knew it. And they were still asking me these questions. And I said, I'm not going to play this game anymore. And he, he quit working there pretty quickly. What can go wrong and why? It's 2019. Triangle communications. John, your stories are so wonderful. They build, they build cell towers in, around Great Falls, Minnesota, uh, Montana. I've been to Montana. I didn't go all the way to Great Falls, but there's nothing out there. There's nothing. I mean, it's, va it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It goes on for miles. And the idea that they're building cell towers out there, good for them. I understand the government mandates that in some fashion there's money out of the federal government. But there's a discovery about those, about those switching towers, the triangle, triangle communications. Everybody's guessed it already, but explain, John. Sure. You know, this was a revelation for me. When I was researching the book, I met with a section chief at the FBI, a guy named John Lankhart. And I said, you know, while we never really got any big American accounts, they couldn't sell to Verizon and Sprint. They sold to little mom and pop shops, independent cellular carriers that you don't even know exist, that serve areas that no one else will serve. And uh, he said, you know what's out there? I said, yeah, nothing's out there. That's why they're out there. He said, no, no. All of America's nuclear missile bases are special operations command surrounded by Huawei cell towers all over the country. And I said, well, I've been working on this book for months now. I've seen nothing. And he pointed me to some testimony from Jessica Rosenworcel, at the time a commissioner of the FCC. Now she's a chairwoman. She testified to the Senate that this is going on. I found the photographs of the Huawei towers looking over our nuclear missile bases. The media had no interest. No one followed up. And you know what? Today, years later, that's still the, the equipment that's serving a lot of our most sensitive mi missile bases and military facilities in America. Still Huawei equipment in this country. We've laid out dots here, John. 2001, 2000, dots of security breaches. And the FBI is not uninformed in some of these. I, I didn't make a list, but they're part of the conversation. They certainly were with uh, Pat Russo's revelation in April 2000. Is anybody constructing this and connecting these dots to your knowledge? These are several administrations, lots of opportunities, but Washington's a small town. Doesn't, does anybody drive this story now saying, hey, pay attention? Yeah, um, FBI, I think, was all over this. And they had a team that was trying to do what they could to stop it. But as I said, these are private companies buying equipment that is not illegal. Uh, it took... A uh, few years ago now, in the Trump administration, uh, the State Department ended up taking the lead. There's a guy named Keith Kroc, who was Assistant Secretary of State, and he helped drive this anti-Huawei initiative uh, around the world, really, to get com countries to say we're only putting in trusted equipment. And they started effectively blacklisting Huawei, who had been really hacking a lot of these national networks and, and been caught dead to rights uh, in a lot of cases. The entire African Union complex that Huawei built was all connecting back to Shenzhen at midnight and sending all their information. And so this finally started to get shut down. And a couple of years ago, Congress even budgeted money to rip and replace all the Huawei equipment. Uh, I spoke to someone who was doing it not long ago. And I said, so you guys ripped it all out last year? And he said, well, no, not yet. See, they gave the money, but none of these local companies want to tear out old 4G and put in new 4G, which is what the law says. They want to put in new 5G. So it's all still Huawei. And that was not too long ago I had that conversation. Huawei, what is to be done? The book is Wireless Wars. Jonathan Pelson is the author, China's Dangerous Domination of 5G and How We're Fighting Back. 
John's made the case Huawei is a threat. What is to be done? He lists three possibilities. Scale, change the industry standards, or go radical. And he rejects all three because we come to the fact that what we have here is a challenge to the way we think and the way we do business in the West and the way Huawei must, because it's a product of the Chinese Communist Party, it's a product of state security. So recommendation, John, is built upon Huawei's weakness. What is their weakness? Well, this is the irony. Their weakness is their discipline and their focus and their scale of, of business. Uh, it doesn't sound like a weakness. I mean, our weakness when we were competing against them was that we were all every man for himself and people were chaotic and they would just slice and dice us, divide and conquer. But if you really look at the opportunity here, the worst thing we could do is say, well, let's just try to put all our resources into one big company and we'll get everyone aligned on a better response to Huawei. Maybe we'll give $10 billion to Ericsson or Nokia. That's been proposed, in fact. That looks like China's model, but we're not as good at doing that as China is. They will win. That's like David and Goliath. They would never have told David, okay, you're going to face Goliath, do a lot of push-ups, have a big meal the night before, and here's your sword. Go out there and try to cut him up. They had to go asymmetric and play to the strengths. The American strengths are this chaotic, innovative mayhem that leads to these breakthrough technologies. You know, there's something called permissionless innovation, which is not government driven. It's not directed. It's not industry associations. It's when a company like Uber or Airbnb invents something that's against the law. It's, it violates social norms. You can't have strangers picking you up in their car. You don't let random people sleep in your house. But when these companies did it, they were stopped by the government, sued in court, and they won. They didn't win every single time, but they started winning. And it created trillions of dollars of value. If you look at whether it's Facebook or even Amazon, these are violations of social norms and, and laws where that breakthrough innovation led to great value. China is not going to follow that kind of a path. They can, but they won't. Yes, I'm struck now by how this innovation goes in different directions. One is hardware. Right now, we have a limited choice of hardware on for, for 5G. What is it? Nokia, Ericsson, and Huawei, the three choices. Yeah. However, there are innovators coming on that are not immediately recognizable, I learned from you, as telecom companies. One is Dell. So what are these innovators building that can be used to get rid of our Huawei in the system? Yeah, what I propose in the book is facing their economies of scale that Huawei has as a company by creating an ecosystem that's even bigger. So Huawei may be bigger than anyone else, but they're not bigger than everyone else. This is a $130 billion company right now, Huawei is. But if you were to take the telecom market where if you have Nokia equipment, you can't add a piece of Ericsson next to it or a piece of Huawei next to it. And you certainly won't have some smart innovator say I've invented a better radio or a better switch. You can't plug and play. If you can crack open the interfaces uh, then you can welcome in all these new players. So instead of buying a Huawei or a Nokia radio or switch, you can let Dell say, just use ours off the shelf, HP, Fujitsu, NEC, any of these massive companies can do it. And, and once you start opening this up, the, the success factor in this market becomes who's got the best cloud, who's got the best software, who's got the best chip design, who's best at integrating multiple systems together, all of those areas, the strength lies in, I don't want to say Western countries, because Japan and Korea are great leaders. Europe is good. India is the great software company, country and, and integration company, I'm sorry, country. And the US, of course, is a leader in all these areas, cloud, software, chip design, and integration. These, these are our strengths. China doesn't lead in any of those categories. If I understand your presentation, and John knows his 5G, and I'm just learning from him, 5G boxes are in these towers, and they all are 
these boxes have different things that they do. This, this goes to the right, this goes to the left, to make an example. You present us something called open radio access, open RAN. What is that and how would it change things? Yeah, so this is one of the possible solutions here. And I'm not going to tell you that's the only way it's going to go, but it's if it's not open RAN, it's going to be something that looks an awful lot like it. What that is, is instead of saying you're end-to-end uh, Nokia or Huawei, it's saying anyone can plug in. And the way I would put it is, if you have uh, an iPhone, you can buy any Bluetooth headphones and use it with it. You can buy the $250 Bose noise canceling ones, or you can buy a $19 set because the interface to the phone is open. Everyone's allowed to do it. You can have your own proprietary solution. Your headphones may be better or different and no one else gets to do it, but the interface is open. And once you do that, then you can have some little company in New Hampshire that makes a better radio and Verizon can say, all right, we're going to put it in the network. Right now, you'll never see that. And you can have a big company like Dell say, we're going to make uh, you know, a switch that you can use in your network and replace some of the Nokia switches or Huawei switches and plug and play. Once you open up the competition, you get this whole ecosystem that grows of companies that are dynamic and innovative and not blocked out by kind of standards that, that prevent any newcomers. Remembering that Huawei is state security. So the APTs that are hacking into Vegas, and John has a wonderful example of Vegas, or hacking into any particular system, uh, nuclear codes, any of that, that's connected to the same organization that's funding, subsidizing, driving Huawei. We're not looking at some uh, sinister Dell here. We're looking at the bad guys, okay. What does the cloud mean, John? We have a couple of minutes. How will the cloud help us? Sure. So the, the cloud, the way telephone networks work right now is you have all this intelligence in the local switch. And intelligence meaning if you're driving from one cell tower to the next, it'll hand your phone call off. Now, if that other cell tower is jammed up with other users, it'll know to hold on to your call a little longer. Maybe the quality is not as good, but it, you have all this intelligence in the telecom network. When you use the cloud, you push everything up into like Google or Amazon wire, uh, web services or Microsoft, Azure, any of these cloud, it's somewhere in some remote location, all that intelligence sits and they can use it to control what's happening locally for you. So, so once you do that, you, you get great increases in processing power and you get to rely on three American companies that are the world leader in cloud. And security, finally, the VC funds have turned away from investing in telecommunications because they're just three players and one of, them, one of them's a bad guy, Ericsson and Nokia are the rest. Is that changing, John? We have about 30 seconds. Yeah, I've seen some brilliant products that were tested out in the Sprint Lab and they said, we love it, but it's some little shop in Cambridge. We're not going to put it in our network because if it doesn't work, we're, we're screwed. We'll have to spend hundreds of millions to rip it out again. You can't do a little trial. When you can open up the interfaces, any hardware maker can be a player and the venture capital companies will say, well, now maybe they'll buy it and put it in the network and you unleash billions of investment to help spur innovation in this space. Jonathan Pelson, Wireless Wars, China's dangerous domination of 5G and how we're fighting back. I'm John Batchelor.